All right, well, I want to give a short little introduction here, just so you know, you've got Dennis Sang as co-host, and Dennis was with the uh, the Follett with me and Kurt. I was outreach director, Kurt Dara Technology, and Dennis is the founding director of the Follett School. Um, and uh, we're happy to have you with us. Uh, tell me if I get all this right, because I'm, I'm taking it from the web. Last week, we had Todd on, Representative Todd Onstad, and we let Chat GPT introduce him. It had three things wrong in his biography, where he went to high school, whether he was married, whether he had kids, uh, what his job was. So I'm going to introduce you and you can uh, correct this. Uh, I've got that you, uh, first of all, went to Boyd College. Congratulations. True. And then a Notre Dame Law. Uh, right. So we, we know who you're cheering for uh, occasionally. Uh, <laughs> you've been with Trek almost 30 years and yeah. uh, you uh, came in as a, with the legal department and general counsel. And uh, for 10 years, you started and ran B Bicycles, uh, which is now all over the country. Um, and uh, you're on the board of directors of, of, the, of the Bike Fed in Wisconsin. You've got a National Inter Interscholastic Cycling Association, uh, uh, People for Bikes, and, and uh, other, other things like that. So I did find one thing about you that, wanted, that, that you had left Trek for a while, and then you came back. They just begged you to come back to be advocate for e-bikes. So you tell me if any of that's correct or not, and then you can go on. So that that's uh, all. I would give that a ninety-five percent. So that's pretty good. Um, I <laughs> didn't. I never left Trek. Um, oh. I stepped down in September of two thousand and eighteen. Um, as general counsel and as president of B Cycle, which is a bike sharing subsidiary, and was planning to retire. Um, but then uh, John Burke, president of Trek, asked me to take on um, this advocacy role. So since then, I have been a full time employee. I don't know how that messaging got uh, confused, but I think when you step down from the role that people are used to you being in forever, they just, uh, I don't know how closely they pay attention to what's next, but I've continued to be a full-time employee um, working in the advocacy space since that time, which is way more fun than being a lawyer, I can tell you. <laughs> and the perfect time for all the things going on. And of course, our audience out here are folks who are e-biked people. They're of the age that we want to do it and get out and keep going. So uh, I think okay. your messages will be really interesting today. Thanks for okay. joining us. All right. Uh, any questions for me, or should we just uh, jump no, in? Just, yeah, just go ahead and jump in, and let's go. Okay, great. Happy to do it. Okay. So um, let's start with, this is based on um, a presentation that I did a few years ago for the insurance industry, because e-bikes are uh, disruptive technology that, generally speaking, even though they're not uh, particularly new um, are are way ahead of many of the regulatory um, and risk management structures that um, exist in the United States. So the terminology that you see around these products are electric bicycle, electric assist bicycle, e-bike, pedelec, and low speed electric bicycle. The reason um, why I have low speed electric bicycle here in red um, is because that is, in fact, the definition of the product um, that has been promulgated by uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, which is the government uh, regulatory agency that regulates consumer products, um, including bicycles. E-bikes aren't new. Um, they've been around for a really long time. This was Trek's first uh, version of an e-bike the 1996 Trek Electrek, which was exactly one year um, after I started uh, working at Trek. They, um, they were developed a little bit earlier than that in Japan um, and in, in Holland, um, but really it was about the mid 1990s that e-bikes first started uh, hitting the market in the United States. This bike weighed about 85 pounds and had about 15 miles of range and had a nickel uh, uh, cadmium battery, uh, which was just a whole different um, experience. However, it did raise the issue um, of what is this product and how is this product regulated? 
So the Consumer Product Safety Commission defines a bicycle under 16 CFR Part 1512 um, as solely human powered. And so this product didn't really quite meet the existing definition of a bicycle. And if it doesn't meet a Consumer Product Safety Commission definition, then the question becomes, um, is it a uh, bicycle subject to regulation by the Consumer Product Safety Commission, or is it a motor vehicle uh, subject to regulation by uh, NHTSA, the National Transportation and Safety Administration? So that was a threshold uh, question that needed to be answered uh, in the United States as these products came onto the market. And it was an important one for a number of reasons that I'll, I'll go into. So I wrote the Consumer Product Safety Commission a letter back in 1996, basically saying, what is this? Please let us know. And so did others. Uh, and in 2002, seven years later, uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission ruled that uh, these products, which low speed electric bicycles, which is the, the, the important legal definition or terminology, um, are bicycles uh, subject to the jurisdiction of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. As such, the federal uh, doctrine of preemption comes into play and the CPSC um, uh, has the federal authority to regulate uh, the uh, product specific requirements of this bike, such as how many feet uh, and how many feet does it have to stop? Uh, how, how do the front wheels attach? Um, what are the um, uh, fatigue cycles that this frame has to withstand and other incredibly boring but important things like that? Mm, wow. So the other thing that was important, uh, but not dispositive, is uh, back then uh, the CPSC ruled that uh, e-bikes can be used on non-motorized facilities like bike paths, subject to uh, state and local law. And that was another big, uh, important uh, milestone in the progress of this product. E-bikes today come in all shapes and sizes. So, and they, uh, they are used by all kinds of different people. The bike in the upper left is a commuter bike. Uh, the bike next to it obviously is um, for someone who might be balanced impaired. The, uh, the yellow bike in the upper uh, uh, middle there is an electric assist mountain bike. People use e-bikes for um, cargo to carry their children around. Um, the bike, uh, the B cycle that you see in the lower tier there, uh, second from left, is a bike share bike. So uh, bike share exists in many cities around the United States, and uh, e-bikes have revolutionized bike share because people are much more likely to get on an electric assist e-bike um, and ride that around town in their uh, business attire than they are to get on uh, a conventional um, bicycle. So the CPSC regulations covered the product safety standards, but states still regulated the use of the product. So most states had outdated moped um, and scooter laws. There were no product, there were no laws on the books that had been written for this product, right? Because mopeds, which were the closest thing that uh, the regulations and laws addressed, have gasoline engines. They talked in terms of cc's of displacement something is a moped if it's less than 50 cc's of displacement um, it is uh, a motor bike uh, if it uh, has more than that um, it had requirements like a, a driver of a moped had to be at least 16 years old he or she had to have a driver's license wear a helmet they could not be ridden on bike lanes which was directly contrary to the cpsc regulation that i showed you before so we had a great product um, and it was a mess. And I'll just start with an example um, in Wisconsin. Wisconsin defined a motor bicycle. Uh, it did not define a, an e-bike, um, along with bicycles that have combustion uh, engines with a speed limit of up to 30 miles an hour. They were not exempt from the definition of motor vehicle, but were subject to the same rules of road as bicycles. Whatever that means, they could not go on a bike path with the motor engaged. They had to have a headlight hooked up to a quote-unquote wet battery. 
which I guess makes sense when you're thinking um, in terms of technology in the 1970s, but of course makes no sense today. Driver's license was required. Um, registration was not required. So, and then, and there were similar potpourri of, uh, of require use requirements like this in every state in the United States. There was no discussion of whether or not someone who owned, um, a motor bicycle in Wisconsin needed to have liability insurance for that product. So what did the industry do? What we did um, is uh, we worked with the state of California where all uh, disruptive things come from. Um, and we developed a three class model statute. Uh, class one um, is an e-bike which assists the rider pedaling up to 20 miles per hour. It has no throttle. Class two assists the rider up to 20 miles an hour. The motor cuts out when the rider brakes. And that product has a throttle, but the throttle will not assist um, uh, beyond 20 miles an hour. And class three, uh, which is for people who are commuting longer distances, assists the rider when he or she is pedaling up to 28 miles an hour, um, has no throttle. A little confusing very confusing, I would say, but much clearer than what we had before. And this three-class system reflected the product that was on the market um, at the time that the model statute was uh, pr first passed in California. So then the question became, well, what are all the various use, uh, uh, per permitted and prohibited uses for um, these products? And we sat down um, and developed uh, this chart, which basically defines for each of the, an acoustic bicycle, as we now call a bicycle without a motor, and an electric bicycle for each of the classes, what are the various uh, requirements that we would ideally like to see um, uh, as this uh, model statute was considered by state legislatures around the United States. So in 2018, um, when I first delivered this presentation for the insurance industry, this is what the map, the model legislation map looked like. So we had 22 states that had passed uh, a model statute that was very close to, was identical to or very close to um, the law in uh, California, the model legislation um, and then a number of states that either hadn't adopted anything, had uh, statutes that were actively hostile to the product, um, or just uh, weren't, weren't there yet. Um, and today, uh, this is what the map looks like. So the, the industry has made tremendous progress marching this uh, model legislation, state legislature by state legislature, across the United States, um, getting these products on, uh, the, these statutes on the books. So there are really only two states today that have problematic um, e-bike legislation. Alaska, ironically enough, uh, because there's very little other regulation in Alaska and Rhode Island. Um, and uh, the industry is uh, definitely uh, wor working on those. So a lot of progress and of course the reason why this was important is uh, from an industry perspective for the ability to have regulatory certainty so you can develop a product that works across the United States, um, but also for users to have clarity about what is the product, um, how does it fall under regulatory definitions, what do I have to do as a purchaser of this uh, product to uh, possess it and use it uh, in compliance with the law. <laughs> So status update on Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin did ultimately um, Trek, um, Durrell, uh, which owns Pacific Cycle in Madison, and Harley Davidson. Um, we all got together and we lobbied the Wisconsin legislature. Uh, we got them to pass Model uh, 3 legislation a couple of years ago. Governor Evers signed the bill in Wisconsin, and I still have the pen that he used to sign it. So... Uh, uh -huh. Um, it, uh, Wisconsin has joined the, the modern world. Why is this important? E-bikes are by far the fastest growing bike category. 
um, faster than anything that we as an industry have ever seen in terms of the bike industry has booms and it has busts. Right now, we're in a bust. We had a boom during the pandemic. Sales went up. Every, we, everything that had two wheels and rubber on it uh, sold in bike shops. Uh, people got the bikes that they needed, um, and now sales have slowed down. But there's one specific constant trend, um, and that is e-bike sales continue to go up. In 2022, there were 1 million e-bikes um, sold in the United States. Uh, 38 million uh, Americans rode an e-bike last year. Bike sharing has a lot to do with getting people on e-bikes. If somebody gets on, on a bike share bike in Madison with their friends and they ride uh, you know, down State Street to go to lunch or whatever uh, and they enjoy themselves, it's not uncommon for them to walk into a bike shop and say, I rode that B-cycle and that was really fun and I'd like to get an e-bike. Um, retail uh, bike sales forecast continues to be uh, optimistic uh, for e-bikes, the bike industry as a whole, um, you can see what I was just talking about in 2020. Um, and in 2021, uh, we had a boom. We're now in the nadir of what I would call the bust. Um, and then they're projecting things to um, level back out. But e-bikes by far going forward will be um, the fastest growing segment uh, in the bike industry based on everything that we know today. It's also true globally. Um, it's not just the case in the United States, but all around the world, uh, e-bike sales have uh, continued to grow year over year um, exponentially. So who rides e-bikes and why do they ride e-bikes? So Portland State University um, did a pretty comprehensive survey of e-bike e e owners, um, and it's a broad demographic. It's predominantly male, 85%, uh, but that's true for bicycles in general. Overall, um, in the United States, uh, bike share or bike uh, mode share is about 20% women and 80% uh, men. You can see that e-bikes is a little bit uh, higher for men. And I would ascribe that to probably uh, electric assist mountain bikes, where in mountain biking, um, there may be about 5% of mode share for women and 95% uh, for men. It's older riders, um, folks that just want to get out there um, and uh, enjoy their bike. It is, it, it is not uh, the, the young kid uh, in spandex who is uh, riding around um, like a bat out of hell. It's predominantly uh, Caucasian. But again, that demographic is consistent with the overall demographic for bike riders. Getting people of color um, as adults to ride bicycles is a consistent uh, challenge for um, the bike industry. College graduates, uh, again, which isn't surprising, um, and people who, are, who say that they're in good or excellent health. One of the interesting things about e-bikes is, is accessibility. They allow people who might have a bad knee or a bad ankle or uh, some kind of a cardiovascular issue to actually be able to get back out um, on a bike and ride it, which overall um, improves their health. So why are they buying e-bikes? As I said, 30% have a physical condition that make riding a standard bike difficult. Uh, nearly 65% uh, replace some car trips. So if you're in the bike industry and you're <clears throat> you're a believer that the bike is a simple solution for some of the world's most difficult problems, this is a really, uh, really positive uh, statistic. 52% of people are riding it to increase fitness. And I'll talk about uh, that. Uh, the fun thing about e-bikes is they take away all of the uh, negatives of riding a, an acoustic bike. So hills don't matter anymore. You can just ride up a hill. Headwinds don't matter anymore. You can just ride up a headwind and you can get to wherever you're going uh, without needing a shower at the end. So a lot of people buy them for that. The question is, uh, you'll often hear people say uh, those riding by on an e-bike are cheating. Even when I'm uh, riding an e-bike, I sometimes feel like I'm cheating if I ride by somebody on an acoustic bike. Uh, going up a hill or whatever. So we had um, some uh, studies done 
um, Outdoor Magazine actually did a study um, and basically found that the cognitive and psychological effects of outdoor cycling um, are equal between normal bikes and e-bikes. And one of the significant uh, benefits of riding a bicycle is you feel better after you ride a bike. Riding a bike is fun. You're outside. You're getting some exercise. You're getting your endorphins uh, circulating. Um, and e-bike is there's no question that riding a bike is good for your overall sense of well-being and uh, mental health. This is um, these are two side by side stats of a trip that I personally rode two days apart uh, without ever even really thinking about what I what I was doing. But I got um, uh, a class three e-bike. Uh, to commute from downtown Madison out to Waterloo, where Trek is. Um, and I took it out for its inaugural ride um, on July 4th, just in the little loop that I do when I'm in Wisconsin. And then uh, uh, Saturday, I took out my regular road bike and uh, did the same ride um, without really thinking about uh, comparing them. And then I was looking through my... Um, I think this looks like an Apple phone uh, re recording of the exercise. And I was struck by how closely they compare in terms of the, the average wow. speed, the time, the distance road. Um, and, and, and obviously I burned about a hundred more calories um, on the acoustic bike, but that's, I still burned a significant amount of calories uh, riding that e-bike. Um, and I, my heart rate, was elevated. It was at 87 beats per minute, uh, but uh, as compared to 107 beats per minute. But an elevated heart rate of 87 beats per minute gives you a lot of cardiovascular benefit. So uh, it's fascinating to me to see uh, the side by side uh, comparison. I'll go away from that one just yet, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. That's that is really really interesting. Do you remember? Was the wind? Do you remember what the wind was? I don't remember. I wow. don't remember. Look at that. Yeah, pretty close, right? Yeah, and you and you actually went faster on your road bike. Yeah. Which is often the case. You know, one of the objections you hear to e-bikes is well, people are going, you know, people are go too fast. But the reality is, um, some messenger or kid um on a road bike in spandex can go far faster than uh the average fifty five year old on an e-bike is going. Wow. That is really, really interesting. Yeah. A little different elevation gain, but. Yeah, but hmm. it was the same route, which is interesting, too, because that just shows you that there's some variability in the accuracy of the GPS and the, and the device yeah. itself. OK, thank you. Sure. So what about accident data? You know, there's a question of our, uh, if people are supposedly going faster on e-bikes, um, are they getting injured uh, more frequently or more severely? Um, and so uh, um, Christopher Cherry at the University of Tennessee did a study, um, and he basically found that conventional bikes have an approximate injury rate of 10 per 1,000 bicycles versus 1.4 per 1,000 for e-bikes, so lower. And this doesn't surprise me. And the reason why it doesn't surprise me is because of the older demographic of uh, folks that are riding um, e-bikes. In Europe, uh, conventional bikes and e-bikes had about the same crash risk. And that doesn't surprise me either because people tend to use bicycles for commuting in Europe uh, much more than they do here in the United States. So those riders of acoustic bikes um, skew a little bit older in their uh, age demographic. Average speeds were a little bit higher um, on e-bikes, but uphill, which makes total sense, too, because the motor is helping you um, go uphill. And class three bikes do travel faster than class ones, but they have about the same crash risk. Injury severity is a slightly higher, which also makes sense because uh, it's a class three bike. So interesting, I thought. So today um there th these products remain uh very controversial they're still ahead of the regulations um you'll see a lot of stories particularly in new york city um, and in new york city uh, there's tremendous density uh obviously of uh, particularly in manhattan of the population 
There's very little room in that city for much. There's a lot of bicycles in that city. Um, over time, um, what you've begun to see is uh, cheaper product coming in. Um, you can buy an e-bike online, you know, today uh, for 600 bucks. And that bike um, has very likely is not UL listed. It has uh, some significant safety issues and bike messengers in Manhattan tend to um, not have a lot of money. They buy cheaper products and they tend to swap and or try and repair batteries um, in a way that they should not be doing. So lithium ion batteries um, are uh, safe when used and charged properly, but not safe if they um, are not used and uh, charged properly. So there's a big uh, social discussion going on in New York City now about making sure that all e-bike um, batteries are UL listed um, and making sure that uh, the products that are being ridden uh, in the city are safe. And this headline to the bottom uh, right uh, just came out uh, yesterday, and you're starting to see some pushback from average folks um, who live in the city who use e-bikes to get their kids to school or to commute and uh, so forth and so on. So um, it is an interesting time in the world of e-bikes. I attended um, a shift conference um, in October in Bentonville, Arkansas, um, and Commissioner uh, Mary Boyle, who is a Consumer Product Safety Commission, um, she's on the commission. Uh, she made it very clear to uh, the industry that was in the audience that the Consumer Product Safety Commission is watching uh, what's going on um, in New York and elsewhere very uh, carefully and will be looking at um, tightening up its regulations uh, on e-bikes. So remember I told you that 25 years ago, the Consumer Product Safety Commission came out with the definition of a low-speed electric bicycle. The Consumer Product Safety Commission, in essence, has not updated its bicycle regulations at 16 CFR 1512 since the uh, Schwinn Stingray um, first came out. And there were so many accidents on that bike back in the 70s that they were compelled to write those regulations. They've basically done nothing since. So what oh, she's God. told us is that she loves e-bikes, she supports e-bikes, but it's time for the Consumer Product Safety Commission to get a little bit more focused on uh, regulating the product and what it is and what the classes are and uh, what the requirements are for the batteries, which those of us who manufacture responsible products in the industry certainly uh, support. So um, battery safety and battery recycling um, will be uh, the largest issues uh, going forward with e-bikes and not just e-bikes, anything that uses a, a lithium ion battery, you've all seen stories of fires on airplanes in backpacks because somebody's uh, you know, extra battery charger uh, was faulty. The, the safety of lithium ion batteries uh, really needs uh, focus. So what is the industry doing? The industry, uh, People for Bikes, which is the principal trade organization in the industry, um, and the League of American Bicyclists, which is the consumer advocate um, uh, organization in Washington, D.C., have come out with uh, a guide, which you can find online, about uh, how to ride your e-bike responsibly um, and safely. The industry has come out with an e-bike uh, battery recycling program. So there is currently no requirement uh, in the United States that e-bike batteries be uh, uh, have a path to recycling. Really, at the end of the day, you as an owner, when it's time for you to replace that e-bike battery, you're free to just take it off your bike and throw it in the garbage and buy a new one, which is not a responsible way to manage uh, something um, that is as... Um, potentially volatile and has as many chemicals in it as an e-bike battery. So the e-bike, um, uh, the bicycle industry has come up with a, uh, an ad campaign um, and, a pro and a program uh, to recycle e-bike batteries where if you uh, buy your e-bike from a participating uh, independent bicycle dealer in the United States, 
the cost of recycling that battery, we call it call to recycle, is already covered in the in the cost of the bike. And so when it's time for you to recycle that battery, you just bring it uh, back to the retailer. He uh, or she can take it, package it up safely, and get it back to a, a responsible recycler. So the industry itself has taken a, a proactive approach um, on, on both of these issues. And that um, is what I have for you wow. uh, on e-bikes. I hope that's interesting. Yeah, enough. that's, well, I think it's fantastic. It's really interesting. So in, uh, your bike would just be covered under your homeowner's insurance, right? So that's another interesting question. Not, uh, not always, no. So uh, insurance, policies um, are, of course, uh, a private contract between you um, and your insurance company. And um, insurance companies, reason, the reason why I gave this presentation uh, initially back in 2018 is it, was, it became apparent to me that not all insurance underwriters were really aware of this product um, or uh, had really um, understood how it fits into their um, homeowner's um, policy form. So we began educating the insurance industry and different insurance companies are actually still all over the place. Some insurance companies will cover a class one or a class two bike, just like an acoustic bike. So if you are on in a, in a bicycle accident on a bike path on your acoustic bike, Generally speaking, um, you are relatively well assured that you've got a coverage under your homeowner policy, assuming you're a homeowner and you have a homeowner's policy. Oh, and oh, under your umbrella policy, assuming that that policy follows form uh, on your underlying policy. Others, um, however, have excluded coverage for e-bikes entirely, um, and others um, just require a rider. So my, my insurance company, like many in Wisconsin, is American Family. And uh, they just, I specifically let them know which e-bikes that I have. And it's a $35, you know, additional charge. So if you have an e-bike and you ride an e-bike, it's a good thing to let your insurance company know. Very interesting. Uh, um, and and the, the lithium that you guys get, you know, of course, sourcing it now and all the things going on with it, where, where do you source where do you get your batteries? So we get our batteries, uh, generally speaking, from the drivetrain component manufacturers. So the principal um, drivetrain component manufacturers of uh, reasonable reputation currently um, out there now are uh, Bosch. So you're familiar with Bosch. It's a big German manufacturer. Shimano. Sure. Um, which is a large um, Japanese manufacturer of uh, bicycle components and a, f and a few others. Um, and I don't know, I'm sure our sustainability department can answer the question of where they're sourced, uh, but I cannot uh, tell you exactly um, where that lithium is sourced. Yeah, I just know that they're, uh, Exxon, I think today just decided they're setting up something huge. I think it was in Arkansas to get extract lithium from water salt water and water I, anyway it's that I, the whole sourcing of that i know gets to be things about imports and tariffs and trade yeah i think i think um they are um they're finding you know deposits of lithium based on what i read in a lot of um different places in the united states we should have lithium independence if you will um i, I would i would think within a reasonable uh, yeah period uh, there's of time. There's some questions in the chat and see, I'm on a different machine here. I'm not sure I can see. So, or not. Um, what, what I will say while, while you're looking up the questions is that probably the biggest source of battery safety issues and battery safety fires. There are two. One is in the United States. Those of you who've traveled internationally know that you can come into the country with up to $800 in goods uh, duty free. That used to be $200. Um, and so the um, reality is that applies to people who are importing products as well as you who are coming in um, on, from home back from your vacation. So many e-bikes come into this country, duty e-bikes and e-bike batteries come into this country duty free and essentially without regulation. 
Um, and that's where most of the safety issues come from. The other place that safety issues come from are people using uh, chargers that are not designed for that battery. So if you have an e-bike, use the charger that came with the battery. It's important. In apartments, some apartment managers and others, since these fires have started, uh, they're free to control their own apartment and say you can't have an e-bike, right? Some do. Um, they 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 do. Um, and I'm I'm not aware of it. It comes up more in the context. Certainly in New York, that's happened. Um, and it, but it comes up more in the context of uh, uh, retail. Um, stores and the landlords that uh are managing a, a retail mall they want to know what 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 products you have in your um, store all right let's see if i can see these chats i then oh there we are okay um what's the cost of most e-bike batteries is there a difference in that between class one two and three the difference would come um, in terms of capacity. Um, th that is how, think of it in terms of a gas can, right? So there's, you get a five gallon gas can or a 10 gallon gas can. Um, the price on batteries uh, can be anywhere uh, from a couple of hundred dollars, which I would not recommend, uh, to six to $800 for any bike batteries, they're expensive. Oh. Um. Does Trek limit how fast their bikes can go? Uh, Trek um, programs its bike to go in, uh, in in accordance with the three class system. So if you buy a class one e bike from Trek, then that bike will not go uh, faster. It will not assist you in pedaling uh, faster than twenty miles an hour. So obviously, if you're riding down a hill, uh, the e bike. Could go faster than 20 miles an hour just as your acoustic bike could go 20, faster than 20 miles an hour but the bike no longer helps you after 20 miles an hour and the same is true for class three the difference is the cutoff is 28 miles an hour. Hmm. well uh, nancy asked why do e-bikes need to be so heavy and i know dennis <laughs> i think dennis i think when you and max got it didn't you have to have a uh a special a, bike rack, a rack that could assist that yeah that's right we yeah the normal bike rack uh, wouldn't hold it so we yeah. we got one actually from germany yeah uh they are so heavy uh in part uh because the motor the components of the motor and the battery uh weigh a lot now that is changing um my wife uh, has a domani plus which is a trek road bike um, that really probably weighs less than my Schwinn 10 speed did when I was a kid. Um, and unless you knew what you were looking at, you would not even know that that bicycle uh, is an e-bike. So as technology evolves and um, as, the, as, as it gets better, um, that, that, that'll change. But uh, that is a good point. Um, if you buy an e-bike and you use a car rack, you should make sure that the specs on your car rack and on your trailer hitch um, are uh, okay for that product. There are an increasing number of products coming out where, there, you know, there's actually an electric um, uh, winch that will lower the trays on the rack down to the ground. You can just roll the bikes on and then hit a button and, and it goes back up. And other bikes that are designed, racks that are designed so you don't have to pick up that, you know, 65 pound bike and put it on the on the tray so racks are catching up just like the laws and the regulations are, are catching up um there's a question about uh just in terms of your work with the bike federation and others just regular road bikes is there any somebody asked chris asked is there any hope for speed limits for all bikes on bike trails so so that um is a very good question and uh one that is uh in a fairly constant state of discussion with uh, regulators. Uh, so in Madison, for example, uh, if you're riding uh, underneath the Monona Terrace where you've got a multi-use path that goes, goes along the lake, and you've got fishermen, the fisherwomen, and you've got pedestrians, and you've got bikes, all that come together into a fairly congested area, you will see speed limits 
posted. Um, some city officials, surprisingly or not, don't believe that speed limits are, are appropriate on bike paths for bicycles because um, they don't believe that there'll be any enforcement. And if there's no enforcement, then uh, what's the point? I personally disagree with that. I think um, that with the proliferation of bicycle computers that have speed limits and with the um, certainly all e-bike head units uh, show you the speed that you're going, um, my personal feeling is there should be speed limits on bike paths. Um, and then we should, then we can worry less about the product itself. So if you're driving a, a Volkswagen, you're subject to the same 25 mile an hour speed limit as somebody who's driving a Porsche, who's subject to the same 25 mile an hour speed limit. And I think that that's a better way to approach, uh, to approach the issue. Uh, so, but that's a topic of, discussion and of course on the road bicycles are subject to the same speed limits as cars and in some places that does matter you know there are plenty of places where speed limits 25 miles an hour and a bike could be easily going faster than that but in most cases obviously uh, it doesn't matter because the bike can't attain that speed yeah with a number of madison of course the number of uh, streets now with the 25 posted 25 on east wash and Portage Road and lots of those, you know, right. ways people get out of town as bikes you know, going through it. Um, right. Bill asked, there are now ads for e-bikes with short tires looking much like an old Cushman scooter. Are those practical and is there no pedaling at all with those? So uh, anything that does not have pedals is not an e-bike. It, it, it's a motorbike with an electric motor. It's got to have pedals to fall under the definition of an e-bike. Okay. Um, those products are very uh, popular. They look like mini bikes, right? Some of them, um, when we were kids, we would call them mini bikes. Um, some of them have pedals. Um, the Trek has a product under its Electra brand called the Ponto Go, uh, which has pedals um, and a throttle. And uh, my kid wanted one the second they came out. I, got, I never hear from them. I got a text from them immediately. Can I get one of these? <laughs> so they're very... <laughs> They're very popular. They are not uh, nearly um, as fun to ride, in my opinion, um, or as practical for any kind of long distance uh, riding uh, than a, a more conventionally configured bicycle. Hmm. Uh, Kathy says she owns two e-bikes, bought her first one in 2013 for commuting and bought a Trek Verve Plus 4 this summer for distance riding and loves them both and loves this presentation. Um, good, good choice. <laughs> uh, what, what's your bike, Bob? Your, which one do you like for your distance? So uh, if you saw that red bike, that uh, was a super commuter class three bike. Um, and um, I used that bike to commute from my condo in uh, downtown Madison um, out to Waterloo. Um, generally speaking, when I'm out riding um, for fun and exercise, I still ride an acoustic bike. So I have um, a Fuel X mountain bike. I have too many bikes to go through here, but I have, I have uh, a, a Domani, uh, regular Domani bike um, that I that I ride here in Arizona. But my wife, uh -huh. um, you know, this year we got her this Domani Plus, and uh, she loves it and it truly is the great equalizer she and i now ride together um in a way that we just didn't before because she can now beat me up the hills and loves it <laughs> right? and is having a wonderful time so okay um are there good e-bikes available for very short riders people under four feet nine inches so i am uh, five feet four inches and um i ride uh uh an e-bike uh, so the answer to that is yes, there are. There are e-bikes um, that you can buy that are configured with step-through frames. So we call them step-through frames today. We would have called them uh, girls' bikes a long time ago. But rather than having the top tube across the top, um, they, they they just have a, a, a U-shaped frame. And pretty much anybody can ride one of those bikes. And the Verve that uh, was just mentioned comes in that kind of configuration. So I would encourage you 
I would encourage anybody on this call that's interested in e-bike to, um, if you're interested and you live in the Madison area, try a B-cycle. Those are fun and easy. Um, they have a step-through frame and uh, definitely work for shorter riders. But go to a good, whether it's a Trek dealer or a specialized dealer, I don't care, but go to a good bike shop and get properly fit and get a product that's at least of, of high enough quality that uh, you'll enjoy it for a long time. Um, how long do the batteries last? That's a good question. Um, it depends in part on a uh, number of cycles and how often they're charged and how long they're used. I don't have an answer that I can just throw out. I've had uh, many um, e-bikes uh, in my garage over the years and never had to replace a a battery, but that's not a fair comparison because I work for the industry. And so um, my bikes cycle through my life faster than yours yours might. But uh, that's a good mm -hmm. question to ask when you go in the bike shop. Do the, do the three-wheeler bikes, uh, e-bikes, go the same speeds? They would go the same speed. Um, I have uh, never ridden one. I have ridden adult tricycles. And I will tell you that uh, adult tricycles are great for... Uh, folks um, that have that may have a balance impairment issue, you know, to get them to be able to go out and ride a bike. They're much more difficult to turn because you you, you just don't have the same gyroscopic effect going on when you turn a, a, a tricycle as opposed to a bike. So, um, and the, you know, any electric assist e-bike or tricycle that I've ever seen being ridden is generally being ridden at a s slower speed. Um, but uh, they would be rated at the same speed. I'm not aware of any manufacturer making a class three electric assist e-bike. My, uh, my knowledge of the industry tells me that they would virtually all be class two e-bikes. So some, the class two e-bike is essentially the same thing as a class one e-bike, except it has a throttle. That throttle is often used by um, people with some level of disability to just help move the bike around when you're not uh, moving it because they are heavy. Um, so if I were manufacturing a trike, I, I would make it a class two bike. And I'm sure that's what the engineers. So if I'm out there riding that bike and I, and I've got a B bike and I didn't pay attention to how good the battery was and yeah. I'm, I'm halfway up to the Capitol or back from campus right. and uh battery dies, can I still yeah. just pedal the thing? You can. You will very quickly wish you weren't. But uh, you, you definitely can. Um, and, but what, you, what, I would, what I would recommend is first, when you turn that bike on, uh, it gives you, it shows you how much battery there is, right? Most of those bikes are supposed to be set to um, a moderate level of uh, power usage, although the kids in Madison have figured out how to hack them so that they go all the way up to turbo. And that's fine, except it uses the battery uh, up more quickly. But the beauty of um, taking a B-cycle is if your battery is getting low, you just put it in a station and grab another. That's, yeah. that's what I would recommend. Okay. Yeah, the first time I used it, I didn't realize that until I got back that I could see, oh, the, you can see the charge, how much was there. And I, yeah. I didn't think to look at that. I could have just gone to the next one and see if it had a little bit more because it maybe it just got returned. It was low. Right. So what you'll see, what you'll see evolve in what's coming in bike share. Um, but you definitely you do see PVC. Two interesting things happen in bike share. So for a time, there was a mix of e-bikes and acoustic bikes in the bike share system. You may remember when B-Cycle was first launched, it was all acoustic bikes. Um, yes. You literally will see people, you used to see people standing at a station waiting for an e-bike to come back. So there'd be three acoustic bikes sitting there and they, but they would nevertheless wait for the e-bike so that they, so that um, they could take it. So you see that, you used to see that going on. The other thing you'll see is people shopping, they'll go down and they'll turn all the bikes on to see which one has, you know, the most battery and then they'll take that one. So what will happen with uh, electric assist bike share, the, for sure the future of bike share is station based electric assist bike share. So Cities like stations because then there's a place to find the bikes, right? People that bring order to the chaos. If you have dockless bike share, you can leave bikes anywhere, and that quickly becomes uh, an unhappy mess, as you've seen with scooters. In, in yes. Um, so 
what's beginning to happen now is uh, the engineers who work on this are developing stations that charge the bikes. So when you put the bike in, it just automatically charges uh, rather than having to swap the batteries. That significantly increases the cost of the station, however. Um, and so you'll see that come, but it'll it'll happen in the big cities first and um, and then it'll slowly spread out. Hmm. So uh, before I let you go here, Bob, uh, when you finished at Notre Dame Law School and looking at your from 88 to 95, were you just biking all around Europe or something and then decide <laughs> I was just going to work for, for a bike company? No, I started my career at uh, Quarles and Brady in Milwaukee, which oh. is a, mm. a big uh, Wisconsin firm. Went up yeah. to Green Bay uh, for a few years and worked at Fort Howard uh, Paper Company. And then uh, started the legal department at Trek in 1995 when Trek was a much smaller company than it is today. And it was the best decision I ever made in my life. It's been a great uh, place to work. Um, have you biked in Europe? I have biked in Europe. Um, I've ridden uh, a number of places. And in fact, Mrs. Burns and I are going to take a bike trip from Prague to Vienna um, this summer. Um, mm. So, I, uh, But uh, we were last year, uh, we rode uh, from Amsterdam to Bruges uh, oh. on the bike pass there, which was really fun. So I have. I've been lucky enough to do that. Yeah. We were just, my wife and I were just in Amsterdam uh, in in end of June, we rode to, to Friesland, the 11 cities up to Friesland, and then came back down to Amsterdam. But yeah. we, we did not ride our bikes in Amsterdam. It was even after spending 10 days biking, once we got to Amsterdam with it, we were scared. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it's, it, it, it's interesting that they, they have bicycle-related urban crowding problems in Amsterdam because they have had such an emphasis on cycling, you know, since the 1970s, right? So in, in, in Holland in the 1970s, um, the mothers of, uh, of uh, they, they started having fatalities as cars proliferated after World War II, I guess. And the mothers in, in, in Amsterdam started protesting and, and they have this, if you look it up, they, would, they had these kinder more, more than, you know, child murder protests that they had, would have on the streets. Um, and uh, the Amsterdam was the first city to say, you know what, this is what that's right. These city streets should be for people, not for cars. And so they began uh, changing their policy to emphasize places in the city where cars aren't allowed, public transportation, good cycling infrastructure. Copenhagen is another city in Europe which has unbelievable cycling infrastructure, com you know, compared to what we have in the United States. We all actually um, uh, are fortunate if you live in the Madison area. Madison's got a pretty good network of um, cycle paths compared to many other places in the United States. So um, part of what People for Bikes does is they rate um, every city around the United States with a score, a single score based on the bikeability of that city. Um, and we spend a lot of time working to try and get federal funding uh, available for cycling infrastructure projects and then help local advocacy organizations like the Wisconsin Bike Fed or Madison Bikes to take that funding, access that funding, and then turn it into work with the city to turn it into um, you know, bike infrastructure. The most exciting thing that's happening in Madison in the next couple of years is the city of Madison Capital City Trail way out on the east side on Cottage Grove Road is finally gonna be connected to the Glacial Drumlin Trail, um, which runs all the way to Milwaukee. So you'll be able to basically ride on protected bike paths from Sauk County all the way to Lake Michigan, which would be a big oh, That's fantastic. Great. That is so, yeah. such, such good news with it. Um, uh, one more, one last question somebody had in here, if I can find it, stealing them. Uh, how do you, is there a way to prevent them? Can you immobilize them unless it's the owner using it? Anyway. Are they easy to steal? I guess uh, they are. They easy to steal. I would say they're they're as easy to steal as any other bike. There is not. Uh, there's not a. There, um, there are keys, but those keys uh, tend to be to secure the battery. Um, 
pretty much anybody can jump on an e-bike, turn it on and ride away. My, um, the verb for that uh, one of one of your uh, participants was talking about increasingly e-bikes are integrated with cell phones. So there's an app on your phone, the phone clips into a holder on the handlebars, and that helps you control uh, the different uh, features of uh, the bicycle. I don't know whether in that uh, integration, there's been some kind of security integrated so no, someone else can't get on your bike and ride it away. My guess is that'll come. Um, there's two schools of thought. There, some people think that a bicycle should just be a simple thing that you can get on and ride and all these computers and all the technology and all the other stuff is just more than we need. We have enough of that in our lives elsewhere. Um, and sometimes just riding a bike with uh, nothing on is uh, much more fun and more relaxing than having a heart rate monitor and your GPS going and all the rest of that. And others want all the tech that they can possibly get. But theft prevention is an interesting um, question. There are various aftermarket products that you can put on your bike. Um, the most common one used these days for privately owned bikes is just the Apple AirTag um, that help you find the bike. If it's taken, you can just tape it under the seat or, or put it elsewhere on the bike. Um, but they're not, uh, there are no bikes that I am aware of that have specific like user interlocks that would prevent someone from taking it. Not at this point. That'll come. All right. Well, we definitely have taken your hour. Bob, it was so great to track you down. <laughs> I know we did a lot of tag, but this has been so worth it. I really, really appreciate it. This is our last uh, meeting. And I think this has just been a great way to tap it off. Dennis, I'm turning it back over to you as the yeah. professor. Yeah, thanks very much, Bob. This is this is really great. A lot of uh, positive comments uh, coming in already. So thank you for the time and uh, sharing your expertise. Great. My Jerry, pleasure. Um, Dennis, I had a question of, of being able to see two slides again. The um, uh, Can we either see those or else get a copy of the slides? Well, the, this whole presentation is actually uh, going to be available on the uh, Plato website. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry. It's, it's been recorded, um, and so you can see it start to finish. Thank you. Sure. All right. Well, thank you so much again. And uh, good. Appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, all right. All right. So uh, it's a pleasure to meet all of you. Um, and I encourage you to get out for a bike ride before the snow starts. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. So Bye -bye. long. And thanks, everyone, for another uh, really great uh, series of, of discussions. This is really great. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank Bye you. Now.